Our gospel is from Matthew chapter 4. This will also serve as our sermon text this morning. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him into the holy city. He placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, You shall not test the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He said to him, I will give you all of these things if you will bow down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and just then angels came and served him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us begin our meditation of God's word with a prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. And grace and peace be to you, my dear brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, the warrior who wins victories, who wins wars for us. Amen. We are currently having midweek Lenten services, as I mentioned earlier in the introduction to our service. Our focus during those services is the Son of God going forth to war. During those services, we'll hear how the Son of God is a warrior and what kind of war he is facing for us. And on these Sundays, we have a special opportunity. Time to focus more, look closer at who this warrior is and the fights that he has done here on earth. And today, we will see that this warrior wins wars. Jesus has fought plenty of battles against Satan. And every one of these battles that Satan comes to, to try to tempt him to sin, Jesus has won. Jesus has to. Jesus, by his very nature, is unable to sin. Jesus is all-powerful, all-knowing. He is God. Any contest against him is as one-sided, I should say even more one-sided, than an arm wrestling contest versus an adult and a three-year-old. But here, in our text, Jesus came down to earth, and this is a little bit different as he faced the devil. During his time here on earth, he set aside, he didn't make full use of his divinity. He humbled himself. He became a little lower than the heavenly beings, the, the angels, as the writer to the Hebrews explained. While he was here on earth, as the devil tempted him, they were real temptations. He was tempted in every way, just as we are, the writer to the Hebrews continued to explain. And so when we read in our text that Jesus was tempted by the devil, these are real temptations for him. The warrior struggled and fought against these temptations to win the victory. Before we get into Jesus' temptations, though, let's talk about how we face temptation 
and realize how we come about it. Because unlike Jesus, we are very much able to sin. In fact, when we face off with the devil and Satan tempts us, we often lose. Unlike Jesus, we are feeble and gullible, and Satan takes full advantage of that and attacks each and every one of us. The devil is crafty. He's very skillful in his attacks against each and every one of us and against his attacks on Jesus. We see that in our text. But the Holy Spirit seemed like he thought Jesus was too powerful even at that time, that he wanted to put a handicap on Jesus. And so he led Jesus out into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and 40 nights, during which time in Luke, explains to us that he was tempted even during those 40 days. And then Matthew says that he was hungry. Explainably so. We would understand that, right? He didn't eat for that long. Of course he would be hungry. And the devil, knowing Jesus' condition, his situation, tried to use that to his advantage. The devil came to Jesus and suggested for him, if you are the Son of God... Command these stones to become bread. At first glance, that doesn't seem like a temptation, does it? I mean, where's the sin within the devil's words? But here's the crux of the temptation. Here is where the sin is. Satan wanted Jesus to have a lack of trust in God the Father. Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights without food. He had to be miraculously sustained by his Father in heaven. And yet, Satan was trying to have Jesus have a lack of trust. God the Son, to have a lack of trust in his Father. To provide for his one and only begotten Son. Even though he's been provided for him time and time again here on earth. The devil wanted Jesus to take it into his own hands to provide for himself outside of the will of the Father which the will of the Father would be to provide for his own son and for Jesus not to use his divinity in such a vain way as to be nothing more than a vending machine for himself to eat and Satan attacks you in the same way he wants you to have a lack of trust in God as well And so he whispers in your ears such temptations as, Are you sure you can give that big of an offering? Can you sure you can give more to church and ask for their special funds that they want? If you give that much, you're not going to have enough to live on. Can you really help those that are in need? Especially since you can barely cover your own wants and satisfy them. How are you going to pay for your bills, pay for the house supplies, pay for everything else that needs to be paid for? God's not going to provide for you. When you hear those temptations going on in your head, you want to fight against it. But at times, many times, you lose. You get defeated. You give in to temptation and you sin. And it results in some, some sinful actions. Not giving an offering to God. Or the offering that you do want to give, you take some of it back. Because you don't think you could even though you really could give that full amount. Or when you hear that an acquaintance or even a family member is in need and you could easily help them out. You shy away from the situation hoping that you don't get called on to help or for you to worry and worry and worry and stress out about how things will be paid for in the future instead of realizing thanking God and being content with what the daily bread he has given you today where we have lost Where we've been defeated. Jesus, our warrior, has won. Jesus responded to the devil not with man's words, but with the very words of God. Jesus answered, It is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus wielded the word of God and he fended off the Satan's attacks as he trusted in God the Father to provide for his one and only begotten Son. As he realized that God will provide for his spiritual needs, which is more important than filling his stomach. The devil lost the first battle. But the devil will come back for a second round of attacks. And Satan, he took Jesus and he brought him to the holy city, to Jerusalem. Went to the very tippy top of the temple. And then the devil dared Jesus. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Okay, this seems pretty obviously to be a temptation, right? The red flag should have been warning Jesus, this is a temptation, don't fall for it. And yet, we see how crafty the devil's tactics are in trying to lead each of us to sin. Because what, the, what Satan was doing here is like someone trying to, trying to pull you down and make you fall. They'll grab your arm and then pull you. And as they do, you're going to brace yourself, right? You're going to lean back to make sure that you don't fall down. It's going to be really hard to make you fall down forward if they're pulling you. But then they switch it up. Instead of pulling, they push you, and your momentum makes you fall over really easily. If Satan couldn't have Jesus sin with a lack of trust in God... Perhaps he can make Jesus sin by having a misapplied trust. Having Jesus trust in God beyond what God had promised. Because the devil twisted God's word to make him say more than he intended to say. We hear the fuller context from the psalm. The two verses right before says, Yes, you, Lord, are my refuge. If you make the most high your shelter, evil will not overtake you. Disaster will not come near your tent. Yes, he will give a command to his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. What God was promising there is those who take refuge in God, he will protect them from evil. He does that in a variety of different ways. Check Luther's explanation on the seventh petition. But he's not promising here to perfect to protect him from every physical harm but that's what the devil is trying to have jesus trust in god to do that unless god would protect jesus from every physical harm then god must not care then but that's not true the promise is to keep him from evil which god could keep jesus away from evil as jesus wouldn't listen to the devil's temptation and by doing so, protect him from physical harm as well. Satan attacks you in the same sort of ways. Trying to have you have a misapplied trust in God's promises. For you to trust in God's promises beyond what he has promised. I see that in several different ways. In one area is within your own Christian freedom. God does not mandate us to worship every single week and only on Sundays. He's given us the Christian freedom to worship when and where we please. And so people take that Christian freedom to say, why, well, we'll skip this Sunday. But as they do, then they skip next week. And soon it becomes they can't remember the last time they were in church to worship. They dismiss it thinking, as long as I have faith, I'm okay. But church is the very place where your faith is strengthened so that you don't lose it. it. Turns that Christian freedom, a joy that we have of worshiping God, into an excuse to not come. Another area where we misapply our trust in God is within the forgiveness we have in Jesus. Your sinful nature loves to reason. If Jesus has forgiven all your sins, then... Well, those times that you really want something, you can steal it. The people that you really hate, you can harm them. 
You have a free pass because Jesus will forgive it. Take it a step further. Living in sin or living a way that's contrary to how God wants you to live. Thinking that, you know what, I'm fine because God will forgive anything. You're testing God's forgiveness as you do that, though. And where we have been defeated, Jesus, our warrior, has won the war. <coughs> Jesus responded to the devil not with man's words, but with God's very word. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. Jesus wielded God's word, fended off the devil's attack for a second time as he trusted God's promises within the boundary that he placed it instead of going beyond what he had promised. Time for a third attack from the devil. And the Satan took Jesus and brought him to a very high mountain. And there he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan, he bargained with Jesus. I will give you all these things if you will bow down and worship me. This final temptation seems to be one out of desperation, doesn't it? If the devil couldn't have Jesus have a lack of trust in God or to have his trust be misapplied to go beyond his promises, he tried to get the trust he had in God completely off of God and to be placed anywhere else. And in here, to be placed on the devil himself. But it makes a little sense. Jesus knew what God's plan was. For Jesus to suffer, for Jesus to die, as we're going to hear at the end of our Lenten season. No one wants to suffer. No one wants to die. And here Satan is giving Jesus another option, another way out, an easier way out. Will Jesus trust in God's plan? Or will he trust in Satan's plan. And the devil comes to you, striking at you with this same sort of attack, but I would say with more finesse. Because Satan doesn't appear to him boldly by, or boldly himself to you and say, don't trust God, trust me instead. Instead, the devil tries to have you take the trust you would have in God and place it on yourself. Because God says some things that you just don't like to hear. God says that you should put the needs of others above your own. But that doesn't sound right to you. Self-preservation says your needs come first and then the needs of others. God says that this is sin and you shall not do this thing. But that doesn't seem right. After all, everyone else is doing it. Why can't you? God tells you, you cannot earn your own salvation. But that doesn't feel right. That hurts your feeling to say that you are sinful, you have done wrong, you can't get to heaven by yourself. Because you want to think that you've done enough. That you're pretty good, and so that should be enough to get to heaven. All these, and there is plenty more examples of how Satan wants to pluck the trust you have in God and place it anywhere else besides God. And where we have been defeated, Jesus, our warrior, has won. He responded to the devil, not with man's own words, but with God's very words. Then Jesus said to him, Go away, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus wielded God's word to fend off Satan, a third and final attack in this small war within our text. He did so as he completely trusted in God's plan. For the Lord himself tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, Certainly my plans are not your plans, and your ways are not my ways, declares the Lord. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. And my plans are higher than your plans. God knew, Satan knew, and you now know that for Jesus to have trusted in the devil's plan would mean damnation for all of us. And even today, for you to trust in yourself would mean damnation for you. But God knew, 
Jesus knew and you now know. For Jesus to trust in God's plan would mean salvation for all of us. And Jesus followed God's plan. He trusted God's plan and has earned salvation for you. And for you to trust in God as your Savior means that you have his salvation. After this small war, the devil went away for a time. Jesus has won, but being true man, he was tired and worn out from the war. He had angels come and served him to recharge him and refresh him. And if Jesus needs to be refreshed and recharged after his victory in order to continue on the fight here on earth, we certainly need to be refreshed and recharged in our defeat. But we don't have angels serving us. We are able to serve each other with the means of grace. That is, God's, that is the gospel and word and sacrament that the Lord has given to us so that we can forgive each other and strengthen each other's faith in God. In baptism... You have been forgiven. And in your baptismal grace, as a baptized child of God, you are still forgiven within baptism. As you listen to the sermon, your faith is being strengthened as it explains and is God's word. And many of you will come up in a short little while for your sins to be forgiven, your faith strengthened within holy communion. We do these things in order to recharge and refresh each other that we may continue to go out and fight against Satan's attacks. We have lost many small battles. Jesus, our warrior, has won the war. To fight by ourselves would mean defeat. But as we follow in our victorious warrior, his victory that he has won is ours. Amen.